I'm joined by my guest, Dmitry Laskaros, in Beirut. He's a lawyer and a uh, freelance journalist. Also in Beirut, we have Marwa Osman. She is an assistant professor at the Lebanese International University and political commentator. And in Raleigh, we cross the Ray McGovern. He is a former CIA analyst. All right, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump anytime you want, and I always uh, appreciate it. Ray, if I can go to you first in Raleigh, in, in looking at politicians in Israel and then the, this whole train of po Western politicians making their homage to Jerusalem, I, can, I, I have this feeling that I have this echo in my head. This is all the same rhetoric from 9-11. This is the, uh, the global war on terrorism all over again, and we know how that ended. Um, and on top of it, everyone, George uh, W. Bush, he has been rehabilitated completely um, and without any pushback whatsoever. So I wanted to start with the, the larger picture, Ray. What is going on here? And then we'll get to dig deeper, obviously, in, in the crisis that's going on in Palestine. Go ahead, Ray. Well, the biggest thing, Peter, is what the old Soviets used to call the correlation of forces. Now, over the last 20 years, the correlation of forces has had a tectonic shift. And that was apparent at the United Nations yesterday when the U.S. had to veto a ceasefire resolution and a prohibition against what the Israelis were doing, displacing people in Gaza. And it was the only, only no vote. Now, that's big. So what's going on here? Well, I don't think Biden is being well advised. Uh, surprise, surprise. I don't think he knows what he's doing. I don't know who's writing his note cards. But when he says, as he did on the plane, you know, uh, I can understand why people wouldn't believe the Israeli version of what happened there at that hospital. I mean, oh, maybe it was maybe it was unintended. I mean, give me a break. So what I'm saying here is the correlation of forces has changed. It's not a multipolar world. It's a bipolar world. It's the United States and its veto against the rest of the world. You know, Marwa, one of the things that this administration is known for is the rules-based order. We hear that all the time. Well, there's no such thing as a rules-based order now if Israel is not uh, held to account for what it's doing. And they don't want us to hold Israel to account. Go ahead, in Beirut. Not only they don't want us to hold Israel to account, they don't even want us to talk about the calamity and the atrocities that is being uh, suffocated and suffered and being put as a burden for a lifetime against the people of Palestine, especially in Gaza. I mean, they don't want us even to report about the massacres that the Israeli entity uh, commit, the last of which is the Baptist uh, Hospital, which took more than uh, 1,200 lives, uh, including women and children, or majorly uh, women and children. It's not only about uh, letting Israel do what it can and what it uh, uh, should in the eyes of the West uh, against the native uh, Palestinians, but also about uh, putting out a, a screen to cover the atrocities that they uh, commit while doing so. And it's it's a bit bizarre to see that on day three of the uh, Al-Aqsa flood operation, we saw how the U.S. and then later on the U.K. started sending their air jet carriers to the Mediterranean as if, like, they have been planning uh, this, but the Palestinian resistance operation just brought it into effect earlier than it was expected. This is what everyone is talking about right now. They're planning to get here uh, because they uh, had a feeling that uh, something is brewing because for the past three years we've been seeing that the Palestinian resistance operations have been escalating, especially in the West Bank and in parts of Gaza as well. So this makes the world see that uh, the so-called uh, uh, police, the self-proclaimed police of the world who came to uh, the help to the aid of its uh, colony in, in the heart of the Middle East, uh, made it very fast, made this uh, decision without even going back to its own people, the people who elected them. They didn't have a choice in that. Neither did the United uh, Nations as well. And we also how it was the United States of America that stopped the very dire, much needed uh, ceasefire, especially for the people of Gaza, at least to get in the necessary humanitarian aid that they need at the moment. Because uh, my friend, before I started the show with you, I was speaking to my friends in Gaza after I was thankfully able to get some internet connection with them. And they said at the moment, uh, operations are being uh, done, surgical operations are being done in the hospitals without anesthesia because they don't have uh, the medicine anymore. And it's being done on the floor because there's no space 
to do it anymore. So it's beyond oh, yeah. what oh, any human But, but uh, Marwa, you, you, you'll never see that on the BBC or CNN, will you? Of course not, okay? Dimitri, what's really interesting, I thought that, that Biden's trip was very bizarre, the bear hugging and all of that. It, it was just kind of creepy, okay? And as Ray already pointed out, he's just reading from cards. Who wrote the cards? We don't know. But what's interesting is, is that, you know, you have the, the UK prime minister there, I think, as we speak. The French president is coming. And it, it's almost as if, as if Netanyahu is giving them a, uh, you know, putting them under oath, you know, they're in, in front of some kind of grand jury. <laughs> you're here now, and you're going to stick with us whatever happens okay and you're going to cover for us and you're going to tell your media to do that for us that's what it looks like to me it's very bizarre dimitri well it was interesting that biden's twitter account uh before he uh, came shortly before he came proclaimed that he was coming to israel in a show of solidarity uh i personally found that very difficult to believe uh, at, that, at that point in time, he had sent Blinken. Blinken had had uh, what could only be described as a disastrous trip from That's, a diplomatic perspective. Absolutely. He was being made to wait all night by the Saudi monarch for a meeting that was supposed to happen in the, in the evening. Uh, he was tongue-lashed by the, uh, uh, the leader of Egypt publicly, which was an extraordinary event. Yeah. Uh, I think that he had sent uh, two aircraft carriers to the eastern Mediterranean, Biden. Uh, so uh, there was no need for him to come on top of the billions that the U.S. provides every year to this apartheid state uh, to show solidarity. I think he came because the monster that the United States has controlled or has created uh, largely is now out of control. And uh, if, in fact, humanitarian supplies are not introduced into Gaza very soon, there will be uh, a level of death and uh, suffering in this already devastated enclave that will far surpass anything that we've seen, the horrors that we've witnessed up until now. I, but, 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 Dimitri, but Dimitri, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's the plan, though, isn't it? That's exactly what the plan is. And, that, and, well, and, and, the, and Western right? leaders are yes. supposed to give cover to it, okay? That, I, I think this is well, all the, intentional. The, the, well, the Israeli government's plan is definitely that. Uh, I, and to some degree, uh, the Western governments are prepared to accept that, but not at the sake of their own hides. And they see that the Muslim Arab world is exploding with complete justification. And so they want to, I think, I, I'm, again, I don't have a hotline into the White House. I'm looking at, uh, looking at this from the outside, trying to interpret what is going on. My sense of what is going on is that there is a certain level of panic because of the immense widespread anger in the Arab world and the Muslim world about what is happening. There is a genocide occurring in Gaza before the eyes of the world. And so Biden, I believe, probably came to Israel, not for a show of solidarity, but to have a frank conversation with, uh, with Mr. Netanyahu and explain to him that at some point in the not too distant future, they're going to have to allow humanitarian aid into Gaza in order to prevent a complete and utter explosion uh, in this part of the world. Uh, and I don't know whether at this, state, at this stage it's going to be possible for anybody to control the monster that the U.S. government has created. I mean, we had the incredible spectacle of the Israeli de defense minister proclaiming at the very outset of this offensive that all rules were dispensed with, that he was going to lift all restrictions on the uh, the Israeli offensive on what he referred to as human animals. The so, man was basically so, declaring so, his so intent it, it, is, to commit war so, crimes. So essentially, let me go to Ray, Israel is exempt from international humanitarian law. This is what we're saying here. Ray? Explicitly. Well, it's called yeah, genocide, I'm, 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 actually. And, and let's go to Ray here. Go ahead, Ray. Uh, the name of uh, what's going on is, is genocide, all right? And the difference is that you have not only Russia and China, you not only have the Arab states, you have Iran. We're not going to tolerate it this time. This time, the balance of power is very different from all last times. You have the, you have the Iranian president calling up the head of Saudi Arabia. That's for amazing. God's sake. Amazing. Yes. <laughs> and then you have the Arab ambassadors in Beijing asking, asking Which, the Chinese, could you please, could you please gather a meeting here? Because we need to all get together with your supervision and your input, because this is a big deal. So uh, if if this ethnic cleansing is launched big time, 
this is going to be really some reaction that we had never seen before. We have actually Iranians uh, visiting with the head of Hezbollah as well as the head of Hamas. So they're getting ready, and then I can sit still for this. I'll just say one more thing because nobody's mentioned this. There's a personal stake in this, okay? Netanyahu can yeah. end up in jail. And so can Joe Biden, okay? Yes. If he loses this one, if he loses Ukraine, if he loses the election, well, whoever comes in could end up putting Joe Biden and Hunter and some of their associates in jail. This is a big personal stake that needs to be mentioned and needs to be taken into account. Okay, Marwa, we have one minute before we go to the break. Go ahead, Marwa. Go ahead. It amazes me how different perspectives we see, despite the fact that we agree on most of the things that were said. But the perspective from here is that we are ready to give our lives. We already gave 17 of our lives uh, from our people, 17 fighters and five, uh, six, six civilians on the border with occupied Palestine. And I, I do believe that the carriers, the aircraft carriers, are there to uh, stop any uh, counterattack from Hezbollah. Yeah. And I don't think it's working because last night was the toughest the night on the border between Lebanon and Palestine. And it was on fire. And I think that the upcoming days will be very, very decisive on whether or not we will see an open war in the region, led specifically by Hezbollah, my people, my country, under the fire of Israel again. But this time, fire back will be heavy. Okay. Well, I'm going to jump in here, folks. We're going to go to a short break. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on Palestine. Dimitri, you know, and Ray has already mentioned it. The, the, the United States is very hesitant to see wars that it, it promotes come to an end. We have this uh, uh, current war against the people of Gaza. And, of course, the, the war in Ukraine, which there were two ample opportunities to end it. The United States said no. Um, they want this to continue on. Um, and so if we look at... But at the same time, uh, they never know how to end wars, okay? And um, so in Ukraine, it's a stalemate. Um, and inevitably, uh, the Ukrainian government will fail. But what are the Israelis going to do with Gaza? I mean, other than genocide, uh, push them into the sea, push them into Egypt, um, govern it, um, have uh, Mahmoud Abbas travel there for them on the back of an Israeli tank. I mean, what's the end game here, Dimitri? Well, their end game, I think, is the expulsion of the Palestinian people from Gaza entirely. Uh, this. This, uh, you know, raising to the ground of the northern part of Gaza or large parts of it, forcing people to move southward, which happens to be closer to the border of Egypt, I think was a precursor to mass expulsion. Uh, that's the plan. Uh, but the Egyptian government wants nothing to do with it. The Arab world will not tolerate it. The world outside of uh, the Arab and Muslim world, I think at this stage, particularly in other parts of the global south, will not put up with this incredible monstrosity. And so this plan is going to fail. It is ultimately going to fail. And the context, I think, here is very important. Israel's strength has always derived from its support by the United States. It receives currently $3.8 billion a year in military aid. The U.S. has sent, as I mentioned, two aircraft carriers to the Eastern Mediterranean. Politically, economically, militarily, in every conceivable sense, the U.S., the superpower, up until recently, the sole superpower, has backed up Israel in every way. But the Ukraine war has showed beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Ukraine is a that the United States is a much diminished superpower, still a superpower, but not the all dominant superpower that it once was. And that will have impacts for Israel. I think the world senses now that the United States and its allies are weaker than they have ever been. And they have an opportunity finally to bring this massive unspeakable injustice that we've seen in Palestine to an end. And I think that this is what's what's going to uh, transpire in the days and weeks ahead. Yeah. We will see this ju injustice come to an end in the not too distant future. Marwa, you want to you jump in? Go ahead, Marwa, go ahead. Yeah, we started seeing that in the Ain al-Assad airbase in Iraq when the uh, Hezbollah Iraq faction uh, sent in uh, bomber drones to the Ain al-Assad airbase. I don't know if you have that in your Western media. And today, that just this morning, there was an attack on the Conico oil field where the uh, American occupation soldiers are there also with bomber drones. So now the interests of the United States of America are being directly targeted by the axis of resistance in the region. And this is a very big escalation mm -hmm. against the presence of of aircraft carriers in support of the Israeli entity. But at the, again, at the end of the day, the main, the main 
people here. The main uh, important faction that we're talking about here is Gaza. And uh, we heard the axis of resistance saying that uh, in each part of Yemen, uh, Iraq, Iran, and, and uh, Syria, and Lebanon, saying that in the event that the Israeli entity actually starts an invasion, a ground invasion against the Gaza, we're going to see a, a full-scale war. But now I think they're going to start to shift their conditions, to elevate their conditions by saying, if you do not allow humanitarian aid to enter, then we will shift into another strategy. And I think we have started to see that strategy in our in our uh, region. Yeah, well, Marwa, those two aircraft carriers, they're pretty big targets, wouldn't you think? I mean, that's that may be tested here <laughs> at one point. Well, it may be tested at one point. Let me go to Ray, Ray in Raleigh. Um, all, the usual voices, the usual um, uh, buffoons in Washington, this is all an opportunity. This is the opportunity of the century. Let's go after Iran. Let's topple Assad. That this, this is the rhetoric that's coming out of these uh, the places like Washington. Ray. Well, uh, Peter, it's, it's delusional, yeah. as you know. Uh, people have to grasp the, with the, the facts here. One very interesting thing not mentioned yet is that NBC, uh, Channel 4 in Britain, they're not buying uh, that it was uh, Hamas that destroyed all those people at that hospital. I mean, this is amazing. There are yep. doubts being expressed in the most mainstream media. That gives me some hope that people this time will say, well, look, uh, this is so obvious. That intercept between two Hamas people is laughable. They don't even have the right accent. So let's let's hedge our bets here and let's and let's make it so that we don't look really stupid as we have almost always. Well, well, well Ray, Ray, this is kind of like the Nord Stream pipeline. I guess we'll never know who did it. You know, they just they, they like to yeah. rabbit hole everything. Absolutely, uh, Dimitri. I'm I'm glad that uh, Ray mentioned uh, NBC because. Um, uh, three um, Arab voices on NBC have been suddenly silenced. People that had experience in the Middle East, in Gaza, I guess they've been furloughed, okay? I mean, this is just uh, the, what the lengths that they uh, go to, to uh, dis misinform the public. Dimitri. Well, that's certainly, uh, and we're talking here about Mehdi Hassan. That's yeah. one of the three personalities. Yeah. And, 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 not not people. and somebody that I, I, I have contempt for, basically, but he should have a right to speak. Everyone should have the that's right completely. to speak. And, and, and frankly, uh, I share your contempt for Mr. Hassan. Uh, although he has been relatively good on the question of Palestine, uh, he's compromised in any respects, and they've removed him from the air. And it's not just, I mean, first of all, that's indicative of the rampant Islamophobia, which yep. uh, which continues to prevail in the Western establishment. But they've gone well beyond that. I mean, you had the uh, the, the, the Home Secretary in the United Kingdom proclaiming, uh, I think her name is Braverman, that uh, bearing the Palestinian flag could potentially be a criminal offense under UK law, uh, this so-called champion of freedom. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and in Germany, You've seen people, you know, water cannoned, uh, women wearing hijabs, you know, uh, accosted by the police, taken away simply because they're waving the, the Palestinian flag. What I find appalling as somebody who spent most of his life in the West is that the governments that claim to represent us are telling the non-Western world that they are a bulwark against authoritarianism, but their current behavior is the epitome of yep. authoritarianism. Well, Marwa, you know, we, we, had, we had Netanyahu, hang on here, we had Netanyahu, I don't know if it was with Biden or, or whatever, it doesn't matter, all these Western leaders are basically the same in my mind. You know, they, they, Hamas are the Nazis, they're the new Nazis. Oh, it was with uh, Schultz, he was there. Um, but the United States is backing Nazis in Ukraine. I mean, it's really quite Thank interesting. You. I mean, there are real Nazis. We saw one in Canada a few weeks ago, okay? And, but, you know, again, this yeah, labeling here. Go ahead, Marwa. Marwa. I mean, uh, your, your guest was saying that it's now illegal to wave the Palestinian flag, but it's so okay to actually to wave a Palestinian flag in the West anymore, but it's way okay to wave a Nazi flag and to support Nazis and to see Nazi personnel in the Canadian Parliament, or at least to see uh, insurgencies coming from uh, fighters, coming from Europe, coming from the US, wearing the Nazi patch, 
on their shoulders. That's okay. That's very okay. It's, it's not okay to support Palestine or to at least have the Palestinian narrative to tell the truth about what's going on in Palestine. That doesn't really surprise us because uh, if we look at how they've been dealing with our part of the world media-wise, we see that over the past four years, they have taken us over, uh, from satellites. They have taken our websites down. They have taken our YouTube channels down. They have uh, taken our social media uh, accounts down and they don't allow us to speak. I know these platforms are Western platforms, but now they go on and they take away their own reporters just because they support the uh, Palestinian cause or at least want to try and tell the story of from the Palestinian side. I mean, ourselves here in Lebanon, we lost our own uh, Isam Abdullah, the Reuters photographer, and Reuters itself wouldn't allow its own self the indecency of saying who killed Isam. They wouldn't write it in their statement. This is beyond words, but this is reality. They control the air, meaning they control the frequency of the, 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 the people use for uh, for their narrative, and now they want to shush anyone else in their homelands by not allowing them to wave the flag, by not allowing them to support Palestine, even by not allowing them to say the term from the river to the sea. This will be a, an offensive act in the United Kingdom. And that's beyond words. And also, we have a lot of friends in Canada and the United States of America that are suffering from uh, oppression from the regimes in those countries because they openly supported uh, Palestine, or at least because they are from the region. They have... Well, uh, they well, are well Marwa, the Marwa, there are... There are Palestinian Americans in Gaza. Uh, what, is, what, is, what is Biden doing for them? Okay, I mean, nothing, I, I suppose nothing. if they were waving a, a Ukrainian flag, they might get some help here. <laughs> Ray, you wanted to jump in. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to point out how insensitive, how arrogant, how naive uh, political hacks like Schultz of Germany are arriving in Tel Aviv on a Luftwaffe plane with the German cross on, which is in all the German tanks that invaded the Soviet Union way back when, okay? Now, hello, does nobody have any sense of history here? Uh, the answer is no, they no. don't, but they're gonna learn a lot of history in the next couple of weeks. Yes, and but unfortunately, um, when I look at Amarwa and I look at Dimitri, um, I worry that that war is going to come to uh, to their part of the world. Dimitri, I have one minute left. Go ahead, finish it off. Look, I know it's very difficult right now for those of us who are, and, and I think the vast majority of the people are very uh, concerned about the future of the Palestinian people. But I, if you look at the tectonic shifts which Ray talked about, which are happening in the world today. Uh, and the reaction we're seeing both inside and outside the West to this genocide, uh, I'm actually quite hopeful for the future of the Palestinian people. There is much suffering to come, sadly and tragically, but I do believe that the end of this apartheid regime is at hand, and it's just a question of time now before it finally comes to a merciful end. Well, the, I agree. I, and I, 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 well, I think uh, Ray really set it up really well. This is not the same world that we lived in 20 years ago. And all of your sophisticated military trinkets are not going to change the course, the arc of history as it's being played out here. I want to thank my guests in Beirut and in Raleigh.